Hello, and welcome to the Block Solid Podcast, where we talk about the evolution of property, the newest technologies that enhance and revolutionize the world of real estate as we know it, and how we, the owners, the buyers, the renters, the investors, the entrepreneurs, and the brokers can benefit from it all. I'm Yael Tamar, co-CEO and co-founder of Solid Block, pioneer in real estate tokenization, and I'd like to welcome my friend, widely known as the father of the Jobs Act, David Wild, as my special guest on today's episode. Hi, David. How are you? I'm terrific. Nice to see you, Yale. Nice to see you, too. Where are you today? I'm in Utah. I had to fly out on a deal to meet a client, sort of an emergency from New York. So um, and I'm in lovely Utah looking out over the mountains. <laughs> and do you see lots of snow in there? Up in the mountains, not down in the Salt Lake area right now, but they've had quite a bit of snow and I hear the skiing is fantastic, but unfortunately, I'm not going to get a chance to do any. Oh, well, next time, right? There's next always got to make time for skiing. Awesome. So let me just recap your bio a little bit for the listeners who are not aware. So David Wilt the fourth is the co-founder and chairman and CEO of Wild & Co. He's a stock market expert, best known for his position as vice chairman of NASDAQ. He's currently the founder, chairman, and CEO of Wild & Co., as I mentioned, which is a 100-person firm, right, David? 100 investment banking professionals. It's a DeFi human capital market model, decentralized finance. We're trying to pioneer a new model, investment bank revolutionized. We've got now 100 professionals in 17 states in the United States in the District of Columbia and a couple overseas. So, and we're growing rapidly. That's awesome. So you are a noted expert on capital markets and capital formation. You testified before the U.S. Congress and the House Subcommittee on Capital Markets and Government-Sponsored Enterprises, the SCC, and in front of the 34 member nations in the European Commission for the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD. As I mentioned, you are regarded by many as the father of the Jobs Act for studies that you co-authored that were the first to identify and characterize the long-term structural decline of the IPOs and listed company markets. You headed the equity capital markets and corporate finance at a top 10 underwriter of IPOs and follow-on equity offerings. And you participated in managing more than 1,000 public equity offering transactions. I mean, that's incredible. Just the sheer numbers here. How is this possible? Can you tell me how you got into this space and how you realized that the IPOs were on the decline and how you were one of, you know, I guess a team of people that convinced the government to do the right thing and let people trade privately? Yeah, well, I'm a scientist by training. I started doing doctoral work in molecular genetics when I saw Genentech go public back in 1980 and the stock was priced at $80 a share at $30 a share rather, and gapped open to 80. I was sort of mesmerized by the how capital access and engineering and science could potentially change the world. So I was attracted to the social impact aspects of capital markets long before I think social impact was even a term. And I've been doing it ever since. So I think that kind of helps explain why I like to work in improving stock markets so that we can drive higher levels of innovation and economic growth. It's sort of been my passion over the years. Awesome. So tell me more about this whole Jobs Act process. How did that happen? And maybe a few events leading up to it and what we have right now as a result. Yeah, so when I left the NASDAQ many years ago, and I had observed that there, when they changed market structure, there was sort of at the bottom had gotten dropped out of smaller capitalization companies. And I had presided over a period of time when NASDAQ was delisting many companies in the wake of the dot-com bubble. I kind of call it uh, tongue-in-cheek, the bubble rubble. You know, in the process after I left, I just thought that I saw some things that other people were not observing. And I needed to try and convince people that we changed markets in a way that was really going to hurt the economy over the long run. So I started writing papers at one point, and then those papers got picked up in Washington, and I started to get invited down to Washington to speak. And so it's been pretty good. I mean, I, in the sense that it's not just in the United States that there's been interest in our work. I mean, it's been all, regulators across the globe have looked at it. And, and in fact, I spoke at the G20 one year in Istanbul. You know, I think we, we're having influence. It's just very slow, Yale. You know, it's when you, anytime you're dealing with policymakers, 
and the policymakers are not necessarily market structure experts, it kind of takes a while to get it right. So you get a major piece of legislation passed, which gives birth to crowdfunding of securities, regulation A plus sort of IPO light, and it broadens the toolkit rather dramatically for entrepreneurs. But I would just tell you that it's not the act that I would have written if they had given me the pen and left it up to my own devices. It was a product of a classic compromised political process. And you have to keep going back and there's a lot more work to be done. But the good news is that much of this has been very bipartisan. There was another act that we almost got through Congress and we'll probably come back to it called the Jobs and Investor Confidence Act of 2018. And when President Trump shut down the government over the wall at the end of 2018, it had the effect of pushing the act into the next Congress and mooting the legislation. So you start from square one, but that act passed through the House 406 to four. I mean, it was ridiculously bipartisan, overwhelmingly bipartisan, and the Senate was behind it and the Trump administration was behind it. So, you know, it tells you that there's an appetite for doing things that are going to help entrepreneurs access capital. And I'm hopeful that we'll get back to doing a lot of that with the Biden administration. A little point of historical trivia is that the co-chair of the Biden administration's transition team is Senator Ted Kaufman. And Senator Kaufman was the first one to pick up on our work in the U.S. Senate when a number of years ago, and he gave a speech on the floor of the U.S. Senate that said that if we can get the $25 million IPO to work again, both on the offering and in the aftermarket, we'll get America back into business. So I think that you can say that there's some receptivity, and I'm very, very hopeful that we'll get a chance to work with the Biden administration. Uh, Absolutely. So many follow-up questions, David. Number one, why $25 million IPO? Well, we cut the data in a lot of different ways. We looked at smaller and larger IPOs, and we found that the sub-$50 million IPO fell off a cliff when they went to electronic market structures. And the reason is that you need intermediaries that have an economic model to support them in the aftermarket, to remarket the shares. And what we have now is a one-size-fits-all market that works really well for large capitalization stocks, but it's a bit of a disaster for smaller capitalization stocks. And no so, liquidity, right? You know, well, yeah, no economic incentive for the liquidity providers to make those markets, to get on the phone, to remarket shares, right? If you don't have yeah. the economics incentive, then there's a half a million shares to come in to sell on a stock that trades 10,000 shares a day, right? Yeah. You got to get somebody to be able to take that block of stock, break it up and come up with a thousand, with 500, uh, 1,000 share orders. And if there's no inadequate commissions for people to make a living telling the story 500 plus times, it doesn't work very well. The stock trades down and then the institutional accounts say, this isn't working for us. We're losing money every time we go to sell. So we're going to move to larger capitalization stocks and abandon smaller capitalization stocks, which is exactly what's happened with this market structure. Absolutely. All right, let's jump back into the Jobs Act. Let's suppose I give you a pen right now and I say, write it over. What is it going to be? Well, there's a piece of legislation that I would bring back that was worked on by a number of people. It's been passed around called the Venture Exchange. And we would create a clean piece of paper, get rid of all of the legislation that for smaller capitalization stocks that made these stocks hyper, totally compressed commissions. And we would go to a market structure that looks a lot more like the old telephone quoted markets of you know the ni- early 1990s, because they worked for smaller capitalization companies, you know, and then we create a different rule book and allow people to go out, whether it was NASDAQ, the New York Stock Exchange. But ultimately, you have to create adequate economic incentive for the investment banks to do the investment banking and the distribution and the aftermarket support. It's not about stock market profitability as much as it is uh, broker-dealer profitability, market maker profitability. And if you don't change the economic incentives and make it adequate for people to invest in the support of small capitalization stocks, you won't fix it. And that's the primary thing that needs to be done. There's a lot of other things that can be done to enhance, you know, regulation A+, which is like IPO lights and crowdfunding. I mean, for example, we've talked about taking Reg CF and moving it from a million dollars cap up to 5 million now, but, which you know, one of the, and the number of potential investors, but Look, if you limiting people to $5,000 investment in the public to these risk risky securities, 
And it kind of, you know, you have to ask the question, why does it really matter how many investors are in it if everybody's limited to $5,000 in risk? You've already done it. And so I think that there's a lot of, I like to say that sometimes, I don't know if you know the fable of the little, the emperor's new clothes, where all the adults are saying that the naked. emperor looks, you know, <laughs> horrifically well-dressed. And he's actually walking around naked. And the little boy who doesn't know any better says the emperor has no clothes. Right. And there's a little bit of that. You know, you get a lot of regulation done and you find every once in a while these things that just don't make a lot of sense. And that one doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So. Uh, yeah, absolutely. All right. So I'll remind the audience what the Jobs Act actually is. The Jumpstart Our Business Startups Act was signed into law by President Obama on April 5th of 2012. The legislation had previously passed Congress the week prior into signing with a 73 to 26 Senate vote and a 380 to 41 House vote. And it dealt with different things like accredited crowdfunding, which actually is the cornerstone of what we do at SolidBlock. Regulation D, 506C, allows us to generally solicit or advertise the offer online and elsewhere to accredited investors. That's revolutionary. And by the way, we're working globally and very few other countries, if at all, allow something like Reg D506C. And I think, you know, for that, the Jobs Act has opened up a whole new industry of tokenized offerings. And of course, as David said, regulation CF or crowdfunding and Reg A+. So, David, what is this new act in 2018 or now? By the way, I just mentioned mm -hmm. 506C comes directly from me. It was uh, taken from a paper we wrote called The Wake Up Call for America. And we said, let's repeal the prohibition against general solicitation. And that was a classic example of just playing the role of the little boy in the emperor's <laughs> new clothes, where you sort of said, why do we care who we advertise to? Right. I mean, at the time, if you think about it, Mark Zuckerberg, you know, couldn't go talk about his business and his business prospects because he was in the midst of filing for an IPO, which actually I think got delayed because of violations of this so-called quiet period. Mm. And, you know, if you're dealing with private placements, you don't care who you talk to or you shouldn't care who you talk to. I mean, have a conversation with somebody who's not an accredited investor. Just make sure that when they buy the stock that they are accredited, right? Yeah. So I should be able to talk. I should be able to allow my kids to go to a roadshow presentation. And prior to this, you couldn't do something like that because you would have violated securities laws. So yeah. this is a toolkit now that makes it a lot easier for people to go out and broadly market. And I would like to say that it's a bit of a gift to entrepreneurs in general. It enables you to do things that you couldn't do before and make it viable to go out and raise capital much more broadly. And it's and, you know, so, and, and fortunately, I think that the SEC has been, you know, gradually modifying it and making it even easier. I mean, it's changed the discussion. If you ask me what the biggest contribution of what we did with the Jobs Act was, is we changed the discussion. We put a, a spotlight on the importance of capital formation, and we've created a cottage industry of crowdfunding companies and the like, yours being one of them. And as a result, we now have lots of people out there advocating for larger sensible capital formation, we're creating effectively a movement around it, which I think is incredibly healthy for the long run. Yeah, absolutely. So that's why we call you the father of the Jobs Act, and specifically the father of Reg D506C, or the godfather of the Reg C506. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> it's something. But it takes a village, Yale. I mean, look, yeah. I don't want to take too much credit. I mean, it, we ignited a conversation, and we put some ideas out there. And it doesn't work in Washington if you're the only person saying something. And so for three years, I literally spoke 30 times a year in front of audiences, you know, across the country in front of regulators just to get to create some kind of consensus. You have to understand that I'm not a lobbyist. I came up, I did an MBA, but I was a molecular geneticist by training. And so nobody taught me how Washington works. I didn't take any political science courses. And so I had to figure it out. Well, exactly like uh, chemistry, you know, symbiosis. Grignard reagents. Yeah, you know, <laughs> exactly like that. <laughs> so that's how your education prepared you for your work in the lobby. Cool. What did you learn at the Sorbonne, by the way? Well, it was an intensive program in French language and, and art and culture oh, and, art and a lot of the historical architecture in France. But it was the education I got in France was as much just living in France for that year that, as it was yeah. anything else. Yes, 
Got it. I mean, that was a for, foreign exchange, right? Foreign exchange student program? Yeah, that was a foreign, but it, it was a foreign exchange program. But the fascinating thing about it is there were very few Americans in it. It was mostly, you know, Europeans and people from all across the globe. I mean, from South America. So the common language that we had was French. So as a consequence, it it forced us much more to learn the language than we would have, because that was our that was what we spoke to each other in than it would have if I'd hung out with other Americans, like many of the other academic programs in yeah. France for Americans. So I got back to Wesleyan where I went to the university mm-hmm. and there was a, a competition for people to be teaching assistants for intermediate French. And there were, you know, 50 applicants and I got one or two spots because my French was really pretty good at the time. And it was as a result of being completely immersed in the language. That's amazing. So what did you learn at the Stockholm School of Economics? Yeah, I mean, it's well, Hunter's Hook School on East Stockholm is the name of it. And it actually literally translates into a high school of commerce mm. and, or business. So it was really oriented towards business in general. But I think that the wonderful thing about living in Sweden was that the population was 8 million people and they had they were at the time supporting two kind of global auto manufacturers and the conventional wisdom in the United States was is that you had to have a massive market to be able to do that and the Swedes through Volvo and Saab at the time were you know kind of proving the world differently they were very internationally oriented in terms of you know how they had to operate everybody spoke english as you can imagine they took it for you to walk up to somebody you know, at the age of six in the street and a young Swedish boy or girl would answer you if you asked them what time it was in English. And so, you know, the country had done really a kind of a wonderful job of internationalizing itself out of necessity. But the program itself, they had sort of titans of Swedish industry that would come and speak to our class. So it was really, we had, memory serves me, we had the Swedish finance minister, you know, spoke to our class at one point. I met Harry Faulkner, who ran Alpha Laval, uh, which yeah. is the great, big, I mean, all sorts of interesting people. I met the guy that wrote the first genetic engineering contract, funded Genentech for the cloning of somatostatin, was a Swede named Bertel Olberry. I mean, it was, I've been some really kind of amazingly interesting people that I got to meet as a result yeah. of the school. It's a terrific university. It's the last private school in business school in Sweden, and it's a terrific university. Sounds like it. I've been dying to go to Sweden. All I know right now is Greta Thunberg and Ikea come from there and many other things. <laughs> so uh, very, very soon. So David, I am very intrigued about your name, David Will the Fourth. I'm assuming you are the fourth in your family with that name. What is the history there? Yeah, my great-grandfather and great-great-grandfather came to the United States. From where? And from Scotland. And the two most common first names were men are David and Andrew, Andrew in the high country and David in the area, the borders region with England, which is where the French who had invaded England in 1066 had their benefactor had was King David I of Scotland who gave the French Normans their lands. And so as a consequence, you see a lot of people named after uh, King David I of Scotland. My mother is not happy with me saying that because in her mind, when she named me David, it was from David in the Bible. And so she'll say King David I of Scotland was named after David in the Bible. And that's how she... Cool. So your mother's still alive? Yeah, she is. She's 89. Wow. That's awesome. Well, hi, David's mom. And my father too. He's 90. Wow. That's amazing. Very, very cool. My grandparents are about that age, and thank God they're still alive, but refusing to vaccinate for COVID. (laughs) So, yeah. (laughs) And one thing about older people is that sometimes you can't change their mind. Yeah, look, I mean, there's been so much misinformation. I mean, this is one of the challenges with social media is that everybody has a podium, and the real professionals, you sort of, you don't know who the experts are, who to listen to. And I think as a result, I mean, we'll probably get the herd immunity slower than we should simply because a lot of people will be afraid of getting vaccinated. I will get vaccinated if and when I can. And I've actually already had COVID. My teenage kids gifted it to me after New Year's Eve party that they went to. But I had a very light case, fortunately. Very good. Very good. All right. So let's talk about blockchain. How did you get involved in blockchain and when? I think I'm recognized as understanding how regulation impacts technology. When I grew up on the desk at uh, 
Prudential Securities was a top 10 investment bank and I was pricing IPOs and follow on equity offerings. I got, I was the equity capital markets professional that got all the tech deals, all of them. I mean, and largely because they looked at the time and they said, you know, you've got this background in genetics. I wrote for Genetic Engineering News and they said, you know, he can deal with the technology stuff. So I got the semiconductors and then I got kicked upstairs to the investment bank to run all the corporate finance and put in the new business strategy. And I oversaw the tech and the healthcare investment banking groups directly. And so as a consequence, it's always been something that I've had an affinity for. And then when you look at the Jobs Act and the work that I've done on regulation, I have a deep understanding of regulation and markets. And so consequently, blockchain is just another technology and I'm kind of used to doing that, but it was controversial in the context of How should it be regulated? And I early on before Jay Clayton, who was the SEC chair, came out and said he hadn't seen an ICO that he didn't think was a securities offering. I had a but at a blockhouse conference in New York months before that said that I thought that they were all illegal securities offerings. And I also said that I thought that many of the exchanges that were being set up to trade crypto were probably illegal as well, understanding, you know, the regulation. And that of course created a lot of controversy and notoriety. And People tried to disagree with me, but I, you know, I pointed out to them the reasons why I thought that was the case. And then when Clayton came out and said the same thing, all of a sudden I was in high demand. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, and the hindsight. Cool. So I wanted to talk to you about INX because I understand you've begun assisting that exchange and, you know, they're fully regulated and the first exchange that is a public company to offer tokenized securities. I mean, I really like that company. We actually partnered with INX to list our securities on that exchange. You know, I truly believe in the model. But I wanted to understand if you can tell us about just tokenization platforms and your work together with Dr. Munib Ali of Blockstack PVC for example, driving U.S. securities investments into tokenization platforms? And just what are some friction points you experience working with this industry, crypto and blockchain? Well, it's kind of funny. I mean, everybody runs around thinking this stuff is so incredibly revolutionary. And I, I, you know, look, it doesn't exist without the internet. It doesn't exist without, you know, low cost storage. It, you know, it doesn't exist without computers to do you know, proof of stake. And also it's really kind of a bundled series of technologies or if you will, applications. And you can use these things, you know, separately or in combination, right? One is the block, which is the distributed ledger, which is nothing more than a database that keeps track of transactions. One is this smart contract layer, right? Which is the software. And it becomes incredibly important in private markets where there is in compliance, there's restrictions on the number of shareholders and e- it can help you automate, which heretofore has been done mostly by attorneys. And then the last little bit is the, the key or the hash, which actually existed. And we think about trading crypto with these hashes, but it actually existed. And it was the way that we down in a non-tradable form, which is the way that we download software, right? We have a license and that license is a hash, right? And it's encrypted key that represents the license so that we can then activate the software and download the software online. And so all these things sort of come together and it gives you a toolkit to create, you know, a variety of solutions. I think that the challenge is though that, you know, you can tokenize anything and you can trade it on the same platform, but the regulators are organized according to the kind of thing that token represents an interest in. Right. Yeah. yeah. And this was the issue with INX. And by the way, I'm on the board of directors of INX, the Israeli companies run by Shai Batika. And we've got a number of, you know, really sharp people involved with that company from Israel and the United States. It's a very impressive group. And, you know, Shai's vision was to get registered, to go through the front door regulation. So we got the first two and a half plus years, the first IPO registration statement for an operating company passed through the SEC to issue a token which was a real heavy lift. And so for anybody that's interested in doing things like that, it's, there's a lot of learning, particularly because his business, the business of INX, is the set of registered exchanges to trade crypto, tokens of securities, and derivatives. And so 
you know, what we learned through that process, which was probably pretty predictable, is, is that the regulators of each of those three buckets, even though you could trade tokens for all three of those kinds of instruments on one platform, they want it broken into different entities, right? So that they can regulate because the regulators don't want to go outside their regulatory authority. So if you're the, the SEC, you want to be able to step in and audit things that are related to tokens as securities because you're the Securities and Exchange Commission. If you're dealing with crypto, you want to go, you go through a state and you need a money transmitter license. Okay. And if you are dealing with uh, derivatives, it's under the purview of the CFTC, Chicago's Futures and Trading Commission, right? In the United States. And so, you know, that was a lot of the learning. And then, of course, there are other protections that exist in traditional securities that have grown up through nearly 100 years of sort of evolution of securities regulations. And a lot of these protections that were afforded in controls just were not generally contemplated by blockchain entrepreneurs. And you know, a case in point is, is that if you have marital assets and there's a divorce and you need to freeze the marital assets, how do you do that? In the case of crypto, it's kind of hard. How do you do that in the case of where you lose something? I mean, we've seen these amazing cases where, you know, somebody either lost or walked off with $150 million worth of Ethereum or Bitcoin. Then, you know, shouldn't there be a process to apply to have that replaced? It's one of the reasons why we've had such slow adoption by institutions is because of the concerns about custody, right? And custody solutions. And so as those protections that we understand and love in the securities industry are reflected into the crypto tokens of securities and other related markets, you're going to see an increasing number of institutions start to participate. It also goes the other way, which is how do you get tokens into the traditional security system? Yeah. Well, that's a great question. Something that we're working on with a company that offers now traditional securities to institutions. So first of all, we understood that a lot of the institutions don't have any data or any idea or any education on this. So I think there's a lot of learning curve in here, right? Yeah. And there's a multi-strategy group where the guys came out of Morgan Stanley on the research side that Mm -hmm. actually does research in crypto now. And it's sold to family offices and institutions. And there's an adoption curve going on here. And you got highly qualified professionals that came from the traditional securities markets in many instances that are increasingly, you know, opening up products in the blockchain token arena. And, you know, it's going to be increasingly accepted as a bona fide asset class, but it has a ways to go to be fully adopted. You know, when you look at tokens and how to get them into the security system, and this was the challenge that we had with, you know, with INX too, is that you can't get a NASDAQ or a New York Stock Exchange listing for a token. They kind of don't know what to do with it yet. And mm-hmm. the problem is, is that they can give you an exchange listing exemption in the aftermarket, which means you get away from state regulation and state securities regulation, which is really tedious. If you think about having to go state by state and educate a bunch of state regulators on blockchain, it's hellaciously expensive and very mm-hmm. slow. And it really, really hinders adoption. And so that challenge, you also with DTCC, which is the central clearing party in the United States for securities, you'd really like to get tokens into DTCC so that they can be reflected onto securities accounts. But I think that where we're moving right now is we're going to take ADRs, American depository receipts, and we're going to put tokens into them. And then we're going to take that ADR, which is a security and deposit it so we can get tokens into the traditional securities account system. So you can start to see these things show up on your account at Morgan Stanley or E-Trade or Schwab or any other place that would reflect it. And so it's going to take a while, right? But it's going to happen. The way we're solving this issue of having these tokens show up is by placing them on the private desks of like the OTC desks of stock exchanges. Like Tel Aviv just came up with theirs for the first time. It's called Taste Up. So if we place securities on that, which of course takes time and money, right? Not a lot of money. So then we'll be able to get investors from banks in Israel or also from abroad that are associated with the stock exchange to just call up their banker and ask them to buy a few uh, hundred tokens of London digital bonds, for example. 
And, you know, we're going to do this all over the world, but you're right, there should be an easier process to do that. Right. And, you know, you're doing, whether you call it a technical listing where you have to apply and meet certain criteria and maintain certain standards, you know, or just a technical listing, which is where you're looking for visibility and they list any kind of security at all and you're not subject to their governance. Yeah. But the basic idea is you want shelf space, right? You want to go where investors are so that they can see your tokens and they can access them easily. And to that point, that's exactly what I'm talking about when I'm saying, like, how do you get tokens deposited into DTCC? It's about broadening the shelf space and the utility of the tokens so that any investor that doesn't want to hold a token in a cyber wallet can have the option and the comfort of holding them in their traditional securities account. And there's, a, you know, I'm trying to think of the guy that wrote uh, Crossing the Chasm, but it's a very famous book in technology circles. And it essentially says, you know, that there's early adopters who are willing to go through the pain of learning new technology. And then there is this kind of chasm that you run into where it's very hard to then cross the chasm to get into the kind of the general population. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of sort of enthusiasts that run into the early adopter phase in crypto and learn it. And they go through the brain damage of figuring out how to deal with the cyber wallets and how yeah. to not lose their crypto and so on and so forth. And then, but as time goes on, it just, it's got to get to the point where it just runs and it becomes ubiquitous and it runs in anybody's system. You think about it, you know, if you tokenize a security, it's not much different from a settlement system. It's a different form of settlement, right? And when we did this, we used to have physical stock certificates, and then we went to electronic delivery. And now we've got tokens. And they have different pros and cons, each of them. But ultimately, an investor should be able to hold an interest in an investment any way that they want to. And when we get to that point, we will have you know universality of the underlying investment. And that's the best outcome for the corporate issuer that issues those tokens or security. So when we talk to companies many times, we advise them right now at least to do both, to think about how to maximize distribution of their securities, because I don't want to find an institution that loves what I'm doing and wants to invest in me and tell him, yeah, but you can only own me as a token. <laughs> yeah, they should have options. So if they're not owning our product as a token, what are they going to own the product as? Well, you can issue a, a traditional security. You can give them a certificate. It may not be instantly tradable. That, you know, there may be pros and cons. Mm -hmm. You may be able to, through a token, because you're dealing with bits and bytes, if you're doing a distribution, you can increase the frequency rate of distributions very cost effectively. You can't do that in the old traditional security model where you have to, where doing even monthly distributions becomes pretty expensive. So I think that there are things that you can't take a traditional security and hook it into, into a smart contract layer yeah. and have it automatically deal with, for compliance. instance, all the compliance yeah. in a private securities transaction. But for instance, I could issue a security to you and say, okay, you get the right to exchange your security at any time by coming back to the company and having tokens issued. Yeah. And in which case, then at the point that you want to sell, you can then go in through the smart contract layer and access the system and dispense with the lawyers. So there's a lot of things you could do here to make it more investor friendly. But what is really a difference for the institution or for the holder between traditional and tokenized? In the traditional, I guess they're going to have some sort of a broker hold that for them. What's going to happen? Well, I mean, traditional security, you can take direct physical delivery of a certificate, right? I mean, in Europe, you get things called bearer bonds, right? Yes. And people keep them in their safety deposit boxes. But there's stock certificates. There are, you know, certificate lists, if you will, ways of transacting, which is called a global certificate, which is kept on deposit the trans between the transfer agent and DTCC. And you can only access it through a securities account that's plugged into the system or plugged in directly to the transfer agent. And now we have a third option, which is tokens. Yep. Look, I don't want to undersell the potential of tokens because they can do some things because they are part of an integrated system in a way that traditional physical certificates are not. And because you're dealing with exclusively over the internet and smart contract layers, for instance, you can do some really interesting automated things that take cost out of the equation. And you can also start to innovate on security structures. So for example, the INX 
token that is being issued gives people a percentage of cash flow. Okay, of the right? company's cash flow. Yeah, which is not something you traditionally see in traditional securities. You do not. Well, you see dividends, which is a kind of a part of that, right? Which are not usually paid from you know first or second year. Right. Well, I mean, it, you have to get to the point where they're generating, you know, cash, and then you have to read the documents and the terms under which those distributions would be made. But I will tell you that it was when we went through the SEC review process, mm -hmm. it was a subject of a lot of comment from the SEC. And then we had to respond to those comments. And so it was a pretty good vetting. I mean, I, the, the SEC was very much aware that document was going to set some precedents in the marketplace. And so that's why it took two and a half years. There was a lot of regulatory T crossing and I dotting to make sure that it was done the best way. And I got to tell you, I take my hats off to Shai Datika because, you know, here is a non US national and Israeli who decided to be a pioneer in US regulatory markets and went through this process, which was a grueling process to be the first. Absolutely. Um, I mean, I take my head off to him and he knows it. And I think that many more things will come out of this, not only because INX is the first, but also because, well, what I, what, from what I, know, what I know about the company, you know, the innovative approach stretches to additional areas like bringing in investors and giving investors all kinds of tools to invest. So I think that we're going to see a lot from this company. We have a few minutes left. So I want to ask you two final questions. One is looking back, what do you consider to be your greatest achievement? Yeah, I have uh, three lovely teenagers and they're all, you know, sound mind and sound body and all doing well. And uh, my last two are off to college. One's going to uh, Tulane and the other one is going to Vanderbilt, you know, which are two exceptional universities. And so something I grew up with a brother who's handicapped. And so it's something that I don't take for granted. But look, you know, it, I want to leave a legacy that leaves something for the next generation. So Wield & Co. in our decentralized investment banking model is about creating an infrastructure that will serve entrepreneurs and social impact broadly. And I want to contribute because I think I have a broad knowledge base and I can help government with policy changes that are going to set a better foundation for the next generation. And I think that it's so important, you know, for everybody to sort of pledge themselves to something that I think is more important than they are, you know, economic growth, and upward mobility and opportunity and innovation that will solve mankind's problems, whether it's global warming, it's going to be a tech solution. It's, you know, cures to cancer, that's a tech solution. And you need capital to fund those things, but you also need for a strong national security, you need a strong tax base. So you need economic leadership. And these things are all interrelated. And for the state of Israel, and you know, I visited your lovely country 20 times and we didn't talk about it, but I have more Jewish first cousins than non-Jewish first cousins by marriage. And I've run techno I've run Israeli investment banking businesses in the past out of the US. You know, national security is critical. We're free countries and we value freedom. And the only way that we're going to stay free is that we continue to excel on the economic frontier so that we can pay for security because security doesn't come cheap. Got it. So your company, I'm very fascinated by the work you've done. And I'm sure that it's, you know, it trickles over to your company, Wild Co. And I know that you're very, very busy lately as you guys are raising funds. Can you tell me a little bit about what your plans for the future with that company and then what your plans in life in general, kind of your career bucket list? Yeah, there are kind of two things that I'm interested in. One is we're going to go from 100 professionals to 1,000 over the next five years. And we're going to organize it increasingly. And it's an independent contractor model. We're going to do it in a way which starts to emulate the benefits, but through the cloud of a highly organized, you know, major bracket Wall Street firm. Okay. And so there's something called Reed's Law Network Effect, which says, you know, talks about higher than linear growth rates and revenue when you start to develop clusters of excellence. These are really 
you know, industry groups, product groups, and sales groups in the context of a bigger investment bank where you start to drive collaboration. That's where we're going. And I ran a top 10 investment bank. I'm going to run, I hope, the, the world's largest decentralized investment bank. That's our goal. The other part of it is I really want to get capital markets in public, you know, to work. I think there's such critical infrastructure for all the reasons we've discussed. They're essential. And I'd love to get that venture exchange legislation ultimately passed so that we can create the toolkit to take companies public and get them supported in the aftermarket at earlier stages because it takes down the cost of capital. But more importantly, it broadens access to public markets to companies, what we call the flyover states in the United States. It's just Mm -hmm. an important weapon to be to compete and to drive forward economic activity. And uh, I think if we get those things done, you know, we will directly contribute to a revolution in social impact because the companies that we're financing, a high percentage of them are going to be the ones that are working on things like global warming or healthcare, life sciences, medical diagnostics, you name it. And so that's where my passion lies. You got to create the toolkit so the entrepreneurs can perform their magic And if you can create better toolkits, there will be more magic. Absolutely. I love it. So thanks for joining me on the Block Solid podcast today, David. It was great having you on. So much insight. Yeah, it's nice to see you. Absolutely. You can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or by visiting our website at solidblog.co slash podcast. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to rate, review, and spread the word. Thanks for listening and see you next time.